I'm Steve Gilman, and this is Brand Story, where we help you build stronger, more sustainable brands by sharing insightful conversations with brand leaders, marketers, and professional storytellers. My guest today is Tara Lawal. If you don't focus on the environment you're building, you don't focus on the structure you're setting up, the support that you're giving people, the feedback that you're giving people, then to me, I'm like, you don't have a shot. To me, it's all one. Like if you're not caring about the creative people, you're not caring about the creative ideas. Tara is the chief creative officer at Rethink and leads the creative agency's New York office. Rethink was recently named the 2024 Con Lion Independent Network of the Year and Independent Agency of the Year, plus a Grand Prix in effectiveness for the Heinz brand platform. And the agency has offices in Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, and New York, where Tara is. And you've held creative positions in a variety of agencies throughout your career uh, at Anomaly, 72 and Sunny, Mother, Droga 5. So you have done a ton of work. Um, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a thrill to talk to you today. So one of the things I noticed uh, just in all your accolades is that you have, your work has actually been included in the Advertising and Editorial Art Permanent Collection at the MoMA. <laughs> yeah. I can't say I've ever talked to someone that has uh, their work at the MoMA. How did that come to pass? Uh, it was a It was a competition, I think, where they were putting some... Uh, film assets in the permanent collection of MoMA. It sounds very impressive. It does. I actually don't, <laughs> I don't think I know many more details than that. It was for uh, some work I did early in my career for LG, uh, the phone with James Lipton to get people to uh, think before they text. Yeah, I saw that work. Yeah, it sounds very impressive in a bio though. But yes, so I guess somewhere deep in the MoMA, <laughs> if you, there's, there's, there's arguably something. Well, good. We always want to have like one of those deep cut sort of like people can go try to find that now. Um, I'm glad that's there. Uh, so this is your first time in the CCO role, but it kind, you've kind of been building up to it throughout your career. And you have a background as a copywriter, um, which is maybe a little unusual. A lot of, you know, people come from all different backgrounds, but how do you think being a writer helps you with this role? Uh, I think in a lot of ways, I think communication is the probably most important part of a CCO job. And I think being a writer, that's pretty much the whole, the whole thing, right? How do you communicate clearly? So I think as coming up from being a writer is just really learning how to say things succinctly, how to communicate with people, how to be human as much as possible. So I think as a coming up as a writer is pretty much a natural fit to being a CCO because it's all about communication. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you get all sorts of different talents in the CCO role. And I think your writing background is fascinating because, you know, you're so at the heart of storytelling. And I know that you've also written a couple of books that I thought were really cool, which is unusual. One was a children's book called The Little Pig Piggy Went to the Market in the City. And then I looked through your book that's kind of a humorous book called There Are Too Many Milks. It's kind of like an adult humor book. How did these books come about? So I think my absolute most favorite thing about working in this industry is the people that it attracts and just being around creative people. So I think uh, I had two different collaborators on those two projects you just mentioned. One is Rich Greco, who's a designer that I actually work with again at Rethink. And the other person is Anne-Marie Wonder, who's a brilliant uh, art director and designer and uh, one of the funniest people I've ever met. So I think when I collaborate with these people just working at, at my job every day, I notice that they're, you know, uh, doodling in meetings or they're just hilarious. And it always gets to a point where I'm like, hey, if you ever want to do something together outside of work, let me know. So I think in both of these situations, we just sort of started working on our own side projects and kind of let both kind of like the intersection of what both of our styles were dictate what the projects ended up being. So I, I just, yeah, I just love it. You could tell like there's a lot of energy in it. It's a lot of fun. And uh, there are too many milks book is actually really clever and fun. And you can tell there's a lot of like collaboration going into it between the written word and the art. So it, it makes a lot of sense for what you do for a living. And I think that's just a, a really cool, a lot of people have side projects they never finish. So I think it's great that you actually publish two of them. Honestly, that's, I'm flattered that you say that. Cause I think that that's, um, 
kind of the part that I'm most proud of, right? Like, I think there's a lot of people who say that they want to do things. And then I think there's very few people that go through the relentlessness that it takes to actually do it. I think even with, you know, Rich and I have written other books that we are relentlessly trying to bring into the world. And same thing, Anne-Marie and I are pitching out our second book right now as well. So it's, it's, you have to dig deep to kind of like just keep, keep going and keep pushing. Good for you. Yeah, and I imagine that that kind of energy, you know, I think people in, in our industry that have side projects, you know, a lot of times they get deprioritized or you work on them for a while and you forget. I really respect the finishing and the fact that you're still working on more because I would imagine that that kind of, you know, you are working on creative for all kinds of different clients and all kinds of different stages of their growth and for different situations. But being able to work on something that's just so purely either for fun, entertainment, or education I'm sure that kind of gives you energy for your work instead of takes it away. It totally does. And I think that that's a great way to frame it. Like, I think that this uh, industry takes a lot of stamina. And I think the most successful people have the most stamina. I think a lot of people are incredibly creative, but the ones with the most stamina are kind of the ones that seem to succeed. So I think when it comes to the side projects, it's for just um, a joyful pursuit of that stamina right? Like it's, it's, it's all the same skills. It's just in different forms. Yeah. I think being able to do that and making sure that you do do it really just makes you a better creative, you know, it, it, because it's yours. And, you know, a lot of people are frustrated by doing client work and just client work because they don't get the feeling of control, you know, it's, but, you know, I love that you're doing other collaborative work and, uh, you know, I'm sure that just really energizes you and, you know, it sets you up as a CEO. you everything you're doing is collaborative. So, you're just expanding your skills. Completely. It's actually advice that I give whenever I'm talking to a creative or really anybody within the industry that's starting to feel like they might be a little bit burnt out or feeling like they're going through a struggle. The first thing I'll tell them is to sign up for a class, any class, right? So I think it's something that I experienced very early in my career. I was starting to feel just a little bit tired. I just signed up for an improv class and I was awful improv like <laughs> awful um but then you know I, I signed up for a storytelling class and it's just i any time that you're starting to feel a little bit low i think it's your creative self telling you it's time for a new challenge it's time for a new input it's time to kind of like freshen it up yeah i mean that's really where the gold is is right outside your comfort zone and even if like we're doing great work and we're doing it for clients Again, what you're getting to do a lot is use the skills that you've honed, but you're not trying something brand new. So good for you. I had noticed I had, I had a question about taking the improv classes, and I think you do the story, some of the storytelling stuff at Magnet. Mm -hmm. And uh, the improv classes, I, I taught improv for years. I performed improv for about 20 years um, and to take a touring group all around. And I think the tenants in improv are just life-changing for this industry. Yeah, I have so much respect for it, given how bad I was at it. Like, I think, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, and even just un having a better, under better understanding of game and character and all of that, I think I, I take into my comedy work uh, through advertising. But I think just, you know, improv is an entirely different language and I just have a lot of reverence for it. Yeah, I think it comes in handy, you know, when you're working with writers, when you're working with creatives, because one of the things in improv that I think is so important is finding the conflict as fast as you can. Like, you know, in life, we're very polite. We avoid conflict. But in good creative or good storytelling, you want to get the conflict as fast as you can. Because conflict, where there's conflict, there's interest, whatever conflict means. It doesn't have to be opposition, you know? So be able to find conflict and then I studied theater as a theater director. So the thing that they taught us that sticks with me, I use it all the time is like in a story, find the love. Oh, I love that. Cause if you can find the love in a story, then you know what the story's about. Cause every story is basically about love. At least that's what I was taught. That's beautiful. And cause that's where the connection comes. Right. And that's what everything is all about. Yeah. Because even in stories that are like seem dark or are, are troubled or, you know, it's usually about the absence of love. So it's the person trying to find it again. So I think that that's like one of those things I learned that in theater improv and in this industry, it's helped me over and over and over again. 
when creative is stuck. I think you going and studying theater and being involved in that probably makes you a better uh, creative all the time. I'm going to steal that, Steve. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Happy to share it. I swear to God, that's I, I don't use anything more than that. And it's something that like, I can fall back on in almost every situation. It, because when you think about characters and situations, that's really what they're doing. You know, that's the human condition right there. I was looking into Rethink, and it's an amazing agency, and it's in, an independent agency. And you've worked for in net, you've worked for network agencies now, and independent. What's the difference? And what do you? You're at Rethink now. It's a big independent agency. What do you see as the benefit of being there? I think there's well, first, I don't think it's totally fair to to paint independent agencies all the same or network agencies all the same. That's true. Agree. <laughs> I think what drew me to uh, an independent agency when I was looking for a new opportunity about a year ago was I was really looking for the most creative opportunity and freedom. As I was talking to lots of people, I was really looking for a place that was as purely creatively driven as I could find. The way that the industry is going right now, you kind of have the least red tape when you're at a place that's independent. And again, that's not a universal truth. That's just what I found. Um, but I think with Rethink, that's it's it's so pure and it's so driven by creative in the way that it's almost constructed in a very uh, a very clear, pure way that it gives me the most, it attracts the most creative-minded people. It's doing some of the most creative breakthrough work because of that singular vision. And that's what I was really craving and that's what I was really looking for. Yeah, I like how you put that. And I, I agree with you. Like every agency is different. It has so much to do with the leadership, the culture. So it's very hard to compare. It's definitely not apples to apples or even apples to oranges. But, you know, the independent agencies sometimes just have a little bit more freedom mm -hmm. and a little bit less red tape. So they they have, when it's done right and you have the right leadership, I think they have a little bit of a startup mentality that they keep. You know, mm -hmm. of like breaking boundaries and doing things a little bit different. And I really admire that. You can see it in your all's work. Yeah. And I think what was kind of beautiful about joining Rethink New York at the time and the the size that it was, is it has the good things about a startup mentality, but not the bad things with having um, 25 years of Rethink Canada behind it. Right. So it kind of had this like, uh, we're creatively driven and are in a position to take lots of creative risks, but also have the backing of uh, a more stable and established agency, which is a, a, a great balance. Yeah, because the you know if you're too much of a startup, that's a different kind of constraint mm -hmm. and pressure. So yeah, you really, I think Rethink is really in a sweet spot right now. There's a ton of Rethink work I could ask you about. But the first thing I wanted to ask you about is probably one of the smaller things you've done. You did this thing with the Feel Good Foundation for September 11th. And, you know, you went to the city's pizzerias and did this cool thing. It's like one of the coolest examples of an agency giving back. Can you tell me about this project? Yeah, absolutely. I, this was, we we're so proud of this one. And um, basically we have a culture of uh, really healthy doing proactive work in our culture. It's, it's kind of like a regular pr uh, practice. It's been a regular practice of rethink since the beginning and one of our creatives, Gabriel Seringer, came to us um, just maybe about a month and a half ago. I think it may have even been less than that. And he came with this proactive idea. And immediately, we all jumped on it. And it was like, this is such a fantastic idea. Uh, we found John Feel um, as the perfect partner almost immediately. I think it was like he responded back in like less than a day, was a partner by the end of that day. and. Um, and basically with like a very small nimble team, we just started reaching out to the, the pizza places in New York. I think you can always tell if an idea is really special and really good by how quickly people rally behind it. At almost every single step of the way, it was more yeses and more excitement. I think it's just such a beautiful idea. I can't believe it came together that quickly. It's called the Walls of Honor Project. So you literally went into some of the most famous pizzerias in New York, like Prince Street Pizza and John's and all these. Polly G's, yeah. Yeah, and Polly G's. And what did you all do? Because it seems logistically very difficult. Yeah, basically what we did was we wanted to take those iconic celebrity walls that you see in a lot of those, you know, classic New York pizzerias. And instead of uh, having Paul Rudd 
on the wall, take them down, and instead put up some of the responders from 9-11 who are still dealing with some health health issues from 9-11 and put their photos up on the wall to raise awareness for the Feel Good Foundation and the, the good work that they're doing and kind of have them be honored instead of celebrities in a very New York way. That's so great. It's a very, I think, a very simple idea and a very, it's kind of, um, what Rethink does so well is it kind of uncovers truths hidden in plain sight. So I think what's so simple and beautiful is that we all know that um, New York pizzerias having your uh, face on the wall is a sign of honor. And being able to kind of take that that simple truth that we all know and use it in a different way to subvert it and to use it for good was a really nice thing. I think that's just such amazing work and it's so simple but it's so human and it's very emotional. And I think it gets to like our, who are we honoring and why and who should we really be honoring? And it's just a really good human story. And there is a ton of love in it. I just think it's like such a sweet thing to do as well. So I really love that. And it seems like from what I've read about Rethink, you know, you all are very good at and very focused on finding those like human insights and uncovering things that are, that are like truths like that. So is there any campaign that you've worked on? Cause there's so many, I could just keep asking you about work for rethink, but is there something that you're just particularly proud of? When it comes to truths, there's something also that we did recently at, at rethink New York, uh, the epidemic sound campaign. Yeah. That, that was another thing that was very much about um, uncovering truths. And this idea was the feel it, find it campaign. And it was all about finding the basically um, all sorts of corners of New York and London and LA that had a specific insight or a specific feeling, and then finding the perfect sound that matched that feeling. There was 500 placements across those three cities, and it was a, you know an incredible copywriting exercise, essentially. I think that's another thing where you can start in a place that's a little bit more emotional, a little bit more feely. But we then immediately took it to a comedic place in some places. Um, but I think what I love most about uh, advertising, what I love most about basically all of uh, entertainment, any of my writing, is when uh, you're you know, doing more like observational comedy, doing more insights and finding connections. I mean, you, you talked about it earlier as finding the love. Right. I think um, the way I think about it is it's like when you're finding that that place of connection and you're saying something to people that maybe they've never heard out loud before or articulated to themselves. But once you say it or hear it, everybody knows what that is. So I think that that's something that the Epidemic Sound campaign did really well. That's just something that, uh, you know, my Too Many Milks book did. But to me, that's the whenever that moment happens, I feel like it's been a success. That's for sure. I mean, I think that's the secret to great advertising in so many ways is getting that moment that we all recognize mm -hmm. and have a feeling about immediately. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like someone tapping you on the shoulder. So you're not interrupting me, making, selling me something. You're entertaining me, but reminding me of something I already think, believe, feel, or have a reaction to. And I think you all are very, very good at that. A lot of your work has that element in it. Exactly. I think that that's been the the secret to the success of Rethink in the past couple of years as well, is really finding those truths, tapping into those truths, and then having a great time with them, right? That, that That's why the work feels very joyful and very breakthrough and very relevant, because it almost hits a lightning bolt and then puts it in plain sight. Yeah. And that joy is contagious. There's so much, so many people do marketing that takes itself so seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think in as busy a world we have with as many things as we have going on that are challenging, that little moment of like inspiration and joy or making someone smile is invaluable. I think that's what makes the job really fun too. We've kind of realized lately when we've been talking about it or when you kind of feel like you have that like lightning moment or whatever we want to call it, it's almost like you, you like snap and you point, you're like, ah, got it. Like that's one. Right. Yeah. Right. You almost like, and, and it's almost like that feeling that, you know, ah, oh, that's the idea. And that sort of like feeling of excitement or that endorphin hit is what sort of drives you to be like, ah, oh, we got to do that idea. Cause it's really going to hurt us if we don't. 
right? And I think that's the thing that sort of like drives us. It's like uh, the worst and best feeling I have is when you hear an idea and then you almost immediately know that you have to sell it because it's going to hurt you too much if you don't. Right. You know? Because <laughs> yeah, I think as soon as you're saying we have to do it, and that's a feeling. That's a way to articulate a feeling. It's like I recognize this. I feel this. And then you'll fight for it. Really great ideas, I think, are that thing where you have that instantaneous emotional reaction like that. And that's what the audience feels. That's connection. Right? That's that's love. That's what they'll feel. That's what That's what people will feel because you remember what you felt the first time that you heard it and you can't always perfectly justify it. And we will try and we at rethink will create honestly, some of the most beautiful decks and the smartest decks I've ever read or seen that set up these ideas, but you can't always uh, fight that original magic feeling you had. Having gone through a ton of your all's work, you're marketing from the heart, you know, and there's heart marketing and head marketing. I've always thought, you know, and a lot of times agencies and bureaucracy or clients, it, you know, there's, it happens where all of a sudden it becomes a head idea and it's like logical, it should work. But then there's the hard ideas where you just know they're gonna, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're harder to explain. Do you know what I mean? Like it's hard to explain a feeling. I think the thing that I've been so impressed about Rethink over the past year is that even though it is a very, I think, heart-driven agency, as you're explaining, They've literally written books on on what the the special the special sauce is and all of it, and it's an extremely uh, teaching forward culture. Like even as we're talking about like what makes a great idea or what makes you have that connection or what makes you have that feeling, like rethink has a a whole language of how they evaluate of how we evaluate ideas called crafts, which um, from the second you walk in the door you learn crafts and crafts stands for uh, clear, relatable, achievable, fresh, uh, truthful, and shareable. And that's sort of a, a shared language that everybody has so that it's not just uh, a certain couple of people within the agency being like, I know this is a great idea. We have to sell it. It's then everybody in the agency knows this is why it's a great idea. And this is why we have to sell it. That has to be one of the reasons you're so successful. I mean, because it's very difficult to systematize or put guardrails on creativity. Mm -hmm. And part of that, but it has to be. If you're going to package something, sell it to a client, get it out into the world, you have inspiration and then all the work that comes after. So you all having that format that you all understand in that common language probably allows it a great idea to survive through all the people that touch it and all the opinions you know, because there's some basis. And everybody's a part of it then too, right? Like I, I've, having worked at um, so many different agencies in New York over so many years, there's star players that come and go, right? And you'll see an agency get hot for a while and then go away and get hot for a while. And I think the reason that that happens is because so many agencies don't know how to systematize and don't know how to scale by teaching. When I came into Rethink, when I came into this new culture, I was so wildly impressed by the way that Rethink operates because it seems like we've figured out how to scale and how to teach and how to really grow a culture and really know who we are and how to uh, get more people involved. So it doesn't feel ex like exclusive to only a couple people, but it feels very like it's inclusive. I think that's so much more sustainable. And I love the idea of the idea of scaling through teaching. Because when you do have a couple star players, it's like sort of that paradigm of like the cowboy, you know, the American cowboy, there's one hero, the one guy that's going to come in or, or, you know, the one man or woman that's going to come in with the perfect idea. And it's this very like kind of like egotistical Western way of operating, you know, where the best ideas are usually shared and amplified through a group of people. And that's way more sustainable than having one rock star that's just spouting off the the great idea or the big idea. Completely. Right. And I think essentially like people do their best work when they feel safe and when they feel listened to. And I think you're able to build a, a culture that's a little bit more uh, safe and collaborative uh, when people sort of know the rules of engagement. Yeah. hundred percent. And making sure that's clean and clear is the mark of a good organization. There's one other 
concept that I read about that Rethink has that I just loved the sound of. And, you know, you all are in many cities and you the main, I guess, mothership is Canada. But it was the concept of the long hallway. And I just thought that was really a cool way to think about the interconnectedness of an organization that's spread out. Can you tell me a little bit about how that works or how you think of it? It's really just a way that we can all feel like we're one, right? And and just that we can all uh, feel like it. And even we've kind of gone further more recently. And it, it's not just that you feel like any office is helping each other out at any point, but it's more that we all feel like we're all a part of one office. And I think that maybe because it's a... It's, uh, born out of Canada and not the U S it comes <laughs> more uh, n- naturally. Right. Cause I've been really impressed by just how often people reach out and how open everybody is. Um, there's even just the, like any time that work is shared, there's this, like um, the spirit of like hashtagging everybody who works at rethink, like everybody shares credit for everything. It's just, it, it's kind of like we all start there. And it just makes everybody more open to sharing and to, it, it just happens all the time. It, we all have a great sense of what our strengths are. And so then it's like, oh, uh, I have this killer uh, team at writing scripts in New York and there's a need in Canada for that. So yeah, here, let's go work together on this. And then you guys are really great at um, coming up with these incredibly relevant uh brand act ideas so let's have you help on an epidemic sound so that we can have a breakthrough idea for the fall right so it's like it's 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 very seamless especially in a um remote working culture that portable culture and the ability to like cooperate you know instead of compete i think that makes such a big difference in successful organizations today post pandemic Like if you're, you know, because culture, there are cultures that they can say they're collaborative, but they're truly competitive. Mm -hmm. They just are, you know, and it seems like Rethink is truly collaborative. And I think that that's, you get a lot more support and a lot more open sharing that way. Yeah, it was even like, like something as simple as like when we were at Cannes last summer, every time anybody won, we all went on stage together. Oh, that's fun. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. And it was uh, something as simple as that. It was like, it wasn't even a question. It was just what happened, you know? So I think it's just like, that's a, that's just the mentality. That speaks volumes about the culture for sure. So something I noticed that I thought was really cool and I wanted to call out in your background was that you were a teacher at the Miami ad school for like five years. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty good chunk of time where it kind of connects to what you're doing now in an environment that's like teaching is part of the culture. But like, what was that five years of teaching at the Miami ad school like for you? So I think I started teaching when I was around like a senior level creative into my first couple years of being a creative director. I did it because I partially because I wanted to give back after going to Miami ad school. Uh, But what I really got out of it was it exercised my how to be a creative director and give feedback when your neck isn't on the line. That transition from a senior creative to creative director can be a very, very hard one for so many creatives um, because if your team doesn't get there, uh, then it falls on you and you look bad, right? If, if you're, it's still your work. But I think becoming a teacher in that time period really, really taught me to have a little bit of like kind of like safe distance from the work where I learned how to give really good feedback and how to know that my role was to take every student from wherever they were to get better. And it just, it kind of just like reframed what it meant to be a creative director to me and has kind of like helped me now. um, Just it's, it just changed the way that I'm a creative director now. I bet it has. Yeah. So I think, um, I mean, I loved it also now just in the industry. I know five years worth of creatives from that time as well. And so many of them I've, you know, worked with for years since it was a great experience. You know, I loved it. That's really cool. I think people who are going to be in leadership and especially creative leadership would really benefit from teaching overall. I've done a ton of teaching because I love the way you put it, that it stops being about you and it starts being about how can I get these people to get better at what they do and then pull, you know, pull everyone up which has a lot more to do with empathy and encouragement than it does about your performance 
because it created, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a shift that a lot of people aren't able to make. And I think teaching is one of the things that really would help, like, because it allows you to get out of yourself and see other people and you're trying to just help them succeed. And great things come out of helping other people succeed. You also get so much joy out of like getting them there. Yeah. Because it's it's almost like you're, you've figured out the the thing that you needed to say to get them from there to there. And it's just, and also um, how to motivate people, how to set certain standards for people, how to take care of people. Like, I think um, I pride myself on being able to work really well with almost any creative now, because I don't expect them to act a certain way. Uh, and I don't expect them to do it my way. I'm able to see like, oh, okay, this is your superpower. Let's see how I can nurture that to get the best out of what would be great for all of us. I love that. I absolutely love that. I think not enough leaders, especially creative leaders or business leaders, don't they forget to use the word nurture. And that's what the job is. Mm -hmm. It's nurturing others. And if, you, if you're not going to show up with empathy and not make it all about you, like I think we've all had leaders that were in it for themselves or, or bosses or micromanagers. And it just takes all the energy out of a room. Yeah. There's no way to do good work if so, if you know your leader isn't showing up there for you. I get so excited by creative people, being around creative people and what makes creative people different and what their specific thing is. So for me, it's just uh, endlessly fascinating or it's like, oh man, like the way that their brain thinks, that's that's crazy. That's wild. Like how can we, like how can I learn more about that? How can I talk to them about that? How can... Um, how can I help them grow that? How can I help them uh, bring that out more? Like, I, I think just all of that, like, I'm not trying to do that. It's just, I love it. That's great. I mean, that's where the best leaders come from is people who are naturally curious about others and get fired up because someone else is good at something. You know, I mean, I think that's probably making you great at your job. Because honestly, like if you can show up with that honest empathy and curiosity about others, then it does kind of like rise the whole tide for everyone. That's an invaluable skill to have and a, a, and a really important passion is that curiosity. And like you, you recognize it in other people. Other, everyone has a skill you don't have. These kind of jobs are best done with others because when you're just on your own trying to come up with that idea, it's not a whole lot of fun. Yeah, and I feel I've seen leaders get threatened by that and I, I've never quite understood that. Right. Like it's like the, the more is more like it's like get excited by it. The more we do, the the better it all is. So, yeah. Yeah. And you never know where the great idea is coming from or who's going to take the seed of an idea and accelerate it or make it special. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're threatened by the talent of others, you really aren't going to succeed in this industry. I don't think ultimately. Probably the angriest I get in this industry is when people see uh, working hard on the ideas different than caring about the people. And they're like, no, 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 we, we just need to focus on the ideas. If we just focus on the ideas, everything will be okay. We just need to work hard and focus on the ideas. And to me, that's, I, I like, I, I cannot understand that, that like, if you don't, if you don't focus on the environment you're building, you don't focus on the structure you're setting up, the support that you're giving people, the feedback that you're giving people, then you, to me, I'm like, you don't have a shot. I don't know. To me, it's all one. Like if you're not caring about the creative people, you're not caring about the creative ideas. The other way, and I've seen it, I've witnessed it too, is so old school and counterintuitive and just doesn't work. Like the ideas come from people and you can't just demand a better ideas and not really take care of your people. It's a little like a chef being like, all I care about in this restaurant is the food. If your food's great, but your service sucks, like people aren't coming back, period. It's experiential. Just like working at an agency is experiential. If someone's going to show up with joy, with a great idea, and jump in when you have a cool idea like the wall that you all just did, and everyone's going to make it better, it's going to be because of trust and feeling part of something. If they're afraid and feel like they're just an idea on demand machine, I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of great work over time. Yeah, I've I've also heard people say that like if it's if you're having a good time, then uh, you're not doing good work. <laughs> 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 or or like if the shoot goes well it's probably because the work is going to be bad wow and that i feel completely disconnected from yeah that's crazy to me it's it's just you you should always start at a place from respect if you lose that then i don't then why are we doing this the person saying that is the person to not be around 
for sure, right? So, hey, let me jump into a little different section, and then I don't want to keep you all day. The concept of fear or fear itself, how has it affected you in your career, and where is the line for you between fear and sort of rushing forward and adventure or taking risks? Uh, fear is a daily practice. I think dismantling fear is a constant and I think it's something that I'm working on all the time and really just figuring out like, what is it and facing the fear and, and being like, okay, so I'm feeling fear. What is it that I'm actually afraid of? Like, what is it that is the outcome that I'm most worried about? What is it that the converse, what is the conversation that I'm afraid of having? And how can I strengthen the muscle to not be afraid anymore? Fear comes up a lot and probably more than it should. Uh, and it's, it's really just figuring out like, how can I uh, be less afraid so that every day is a little bit more joyful? And also uh, I can be a little bit more bolder. That's an awesome answer. Thank you very much for answering that so honestly. Uh, I've had some incredible conversations with people about this because especially in the creative field, we're taking a lot of risks. You're putting yourself out there every time you have an idea. And young creatives, people who haven't been doing it a while, like there, I remember what it was like to be a young creative. You're terrified sometimes to get it wrong or say something stupid or have a bad idea, quote unquote. So I think it's something in this industry where you're dealing in a world of ideas that the, it's a different kind of risk taking. Yeah, sure, we're not like, you know, climbing a mountain, we're under physical danger, but there's some emotional danger there and it's a, you know, it can be difficult to navigate. I, I, I talked to this uh, exact issue with my coach this week. And I think the, the reframe that I found very helpful is that almost looking at this more like a game and, and how do we find uh, more of the joy in the day to day of this? And it's, and she, she also brought up this reference of like, when you see children playing at a playground, right? Like it's, it, it comes, the fear isn't of falling off the monkey bars. It's the, it's the joy of playing. And if we could look less towards uh, the fear of falling and more towards the joy of playing, how would that change the way that we show up each day at our jobs? I love that. I hope everyone listening runs that back and listens to it again, because I think that is wonderful advice. Her name's Maureen Falvey. She's a fantastic coach. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. That's why I really like that a lot. So what's a trait of yours that you used to think was a weakness that now you think is actually a strength? I really believe that all of our kind of greatest strengths are also our biggest weaknesses, which is something I think about a lot. I, I'm uh, relentless, but I also, but I think I probably look at that now as resilience. I won't, I just, I won't give up. I think, and that's, uh, can be exhausting for myself and sometimes for others. Um, but I think that that is now probably my greatest strength. Isn't it interesting a lot? I get that answer a lot in that people get to a point where they realize something that they've been driving themselves crazy about. If they work with it, they can turn into a strength. Instead of it just running them, they get to start to use it as a tool. Mm -hmm. So I love that. I love that answer because I think any strength is a double-edged sword. You know, you never know you know, if you use it too much, sometimes it turns on you. And uh, I think relentlessness is a great one to think about because it makes you highly productive, but sometimes you can just wear yourself down. Right. Yeah. Like I, I'll be in meetings sometimes and I'll say, Hey guys, listen, I'm exhausted by me right now too, but let's <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I hear it, but let's, let's figure this out. Let's get the feedback. Let's move on and let's, let's have some fun again. So what would you name this chapter of your life right now? Uh, asking a writer to name something on the spot. You're so evil, Steve. Yeah, I'm only thinking of really crappy title names. But the the <laughs> the main focus right now is really just kind of like energy management. What a terrible chapter! Everyone's skipping that one. The more interesting one is like, can she do it? <laughs> that's the, <laughs> I love that's that the chapter real, name. <laughs> that's the real title. Can she do it? Because the 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 balance right now is I have two children. I'm um, I'm stepping into this job, and I think the the most important thing to me is not just can the each day happen, but can I be an example of somebody who has a nice life as I'm doing it? C can I be a whole person? As I was coming up, there weren't that many examples of 
uh, creative women who had families and uh, just full stop. But if I can show how you can be a creative woman who has a family and is happy or seems like her life is pretty good, that would be the most important thing to me to show that as an example of that can happen. I love that so much. I'm so glad you said that. That's one of my favorite answers I've ever gotten to that question. So if you want a really great chapter title, ask a writer, right? Well, I got to work on the title name because it wasn't great. I don't know. I kind of like, can she do it? <laughs> like, I, you know, if you're in a book, if you were in a book and you're reading it and you get to the chapter, can she do it? Think about how much. <laughs> question mark? Th- well, yeah. yeah. Think about like, I got to find out now, you know, is she going to be able to? You're going to read more. And then also, by the way, just to go back to something I said earlier, there's a ton of love in Can She Do It? I'm already, I'm already rooting for you. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I think you can do it. And that's such a such an incredible ambition to balance all that. So, you know, my compliments to you that that's what you're working on because that's exceptional. It's super cool. Thank you. Absolutely. So last question, and I'm going to let you go. What advice would you give to your younger self sitting here today? I think the advice would just be like, just really enjoy it. And and I think that I did. It's advice that my dad gave. And I think I would just give that to myself. And it's advice that my dad still gives to me all the time. He just says, enjoy the journey. It's, it's very simple. Uh, it's less about what you're trying to do or where you're trying to go, but just enjoy the journey along the way. Enjoy every part. Enjoy every step. I, I love that. And it's a great message to end on. So for any young creatives or anyone young in their career, please take that to heart because I think anyone looking back, you know, as much as you can enjoy the journey, that's going to be the key to success and the key to actually, you know, being in it while you're in it. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I think anyone listening to this is going to get a ton out of it. And uh, I think your career is extraordinary. And and as far as can she do it? Yeah, I think I think so. <laughs> We'll see. (laughs) Absolutely. We'll see. I'll check back in with you and we'll see. All right. Thank you, Steve. (laughs) Want to hear more inspiring stories? Subscribe on your preferred podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And if you like what we're doing, please rate, review, and share. It's the best way to support us. Thank you for listening to Brand Story.